happy Wednesday, everyone. Thank you for tuning in with me again this week. Um, last week, I started a new series, um, which I'll teach this week and next week on a little bit more, talking about the woke movement, right? So I'm woke, but not awake. So last week, we kind of hit heavy with the reality of sin. If you have not caught that video yet, please <clears throat> watch it when you can. All of these kind of build into each other. The teachings do all of them equally important to each other to understand the big picture of what it is I'm trying to teach here, what God is trying to teach us. So this week, um, moving on past the reality of sin. So recognizing sin for what it is. Um, we talked about how everyone is born into it, right? It levels the playing field for everybody because we're all sinful people and we all have the capability to sin and we will and we do it comes in many forms there's no worse sin than another um, god hates it it's lawlessness it's something we can't hide um, it's already forgiven for those who choose to believe but it can separate you from god and it can bring death right so the reality the the heaviness of sin i've talked about it being the elephant in the room for that reason no one wants to talk about it but it's something that needs talked about um, and understood that there is something you are held accountable for at the end of this world. And that is the sin, that is the life you live. So I kind of left you with the question is, do you take sin seriously or are you content living for the world? Um, <clears throat> and just kind of reevalu you know, evaluating yourselves in that question to kind of see where you lay and where you lie um, in that so today we're talking um, along the same lines, so woke but not awake, and I'm going back to tradition. Tradition, the word that people in my generation especially love to hear. There's a little bit of sarcasm there. Um, traditional moral values are frankly looked down upon right now um, in this culture, in this society. I talk about my generation, my age of people specifically, because that is what I see the most of on social media. But I'm sure there are other generations where this is impacting as well. We've lost sight of traditional moral values that this country was built on. So the question I wrote down is how do we become so far removed from what those values once were, right? Those foundational principles that we stood on as a people, as a nation. So the best place to go to this is the Ten Commandments. Um, we talked about this a little bit last week, but I'm going to read through them extensively again today so we can talk about it a little bit more and look at, look at it in perspective of that time of the Old Testament. But first, I want to start with our scripture of the week, which is 1 John 2, 5. For those of you that saw that posting this week, it reads, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we are know. This is how we know we are in him. Okay. So we're talking about obedience. We're talking about obeying not only the 10 commandments, but being obedient in your relationship with God, um, <clears throat> specifically going into the law at that time, what it means and comparing that now um, to current culture, where we've gone wrong, where we've gone astray and maybe have gotten off a little bit. <clears throat> so I'm going to read uh, 10 commandments. I'm going to start in Exodus. So this is also in Deuteronomy. So I'm going to look at both so we can kind of talk through um, and give you some insight into the Ten Commandments and, and the story surrounding these laws. <clears throat> so Exodus 19 is where I'm going to start. Okay. So as you recall, some of us recall um, Exodus, the chapter of Moses, right? Moses freed the Israelites out of Egypt, they were slaves there. They were treated horribly. They were put to work. So he, with God's help, brought them out of Egypt. And then they wandered, right, for 40 years, I believe it was. And so in this time, the Israelites faced a lot of issues with God. Um, they had issues of idols. They built altars for alternative gods. You know, they did a lot of things that made God unhappy. Even though he was leading, you know, fire by night, smoke by day, he was dropping bread from heaven so they wouldn't starve. 
he was actively saving them in this entire time, but they were wandering, right? They were still a lost people. And so this kind of foreshadows the Ten Commandments and how this came about. So starting in chapter 19, so this is at Mount Sinai. So on the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, don't quote me on any of these, they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So this is, as I can imagine, God giving Moses a pep talk at this time. I want you to tell the Israelites, my chosen people, those that I freed out of slavery, brought out of Egypt, have taken care of this whole time. This is what I want you to say to them. So verse seven, so Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded to him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. So God is not only telling Moses these things to tell the Israelites, but God says, I'm going to show up so they can hear me. They can audibly hear me talking to you so that they know that you are chosen and that you have been sent by me to to take care of them, to lead them, to guide them. Verse 10, and the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. So he's setting some guidelines here for Moses. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day, abstain from sexual relations. Verse 16, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them will perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you but the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord if we will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Okay, so this is kind of giving you, like I said, some insight into this entire moment in time uh, before the Ten Commandments are laid out. So God does as he promises Moses, um, ascends on the mountain in fire, right, smoke. You can hear him talking to Moses. He calls him up to the mountain. We're there. He's going to, you know, relay these laws to him. So this is a a powerful moment of the Israelites seeing God 
in, in this manner for maybe the first time, right? He parted the seas, he sent the plagues. There are signs and wonders that followed them the past three months, but this is the first time that they're actually hearing him, right? You have to imagine if you're following a guy, you think of Moses, you're like, well, is he really hearing from God? We don't really know. Is he a false prophet? We have nothing to lose. Let's go. You know, you can imagine how you current times would feel about that, but this gives you reassurance that, yeah, he's actually being sent from God. And so now we're in Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord, your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. So obviously in this moment, the Israelites realize the power of God. They're fearful, right? Um, it's almost not a reverent fear out of respect. It is a reverent fear out of respect for God, but it's also a, they also know how powerful God is that he, at any point getting too close or hearing him or seeing him, you would fall dead to your feet, right? That was just kind of how it was. And that was the stigma around, around who God was because he's that powerful um, and that important to them. So You can see God's need for wanting to lay these 10 commandments out, which we'll go over them again here in a little bit. Um, But the Israelites up until this point had proven that they need structure. Even with God guiding them day by day with Moses's help, they were still lost. They were still, like I said, idolizing, uh, building altars. They were complaining. They were whining. They were Um, committing sins and not fully understanding that they were the chosen people and what that expectation was from God for them. So he feels the need to lay out these 10 commandments, which like I said, is the basis of the Christian religion, right? It's a foundational moral values that most of us have hardwired into us when we are born. Most of us understand that these are things that you do whether or not you know God, whether or not you have a relationship with God, whether or not you're in church, none of that matters. Most people know these things, okay, or have at one point. So the point is now in this current culture, we really moved away from understanding these basic principles. Before I go into each of them a little bit more, um, I want to read this this moment in time in Deuteronomy as well, because it reflects on this same the same situation in a little bit of different perspective, which I think is good um, to understand fully what's going on here. So let's go to Deuteronomy 5, 
So Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. At that time, I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So he goes back and repeats the commandments again. I won't read them through again. It's exactly um, verbatim to what I just read in Exodus, but we'll skip down to verse 22 in Deuteronomy 5. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness. And he added nothing more that he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When you heard the voice out of the darkness while the mountain was ablaze with fire, all the leaders of your tribes and your elders came to me. And you said, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty, and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now why should we die? This great fire will consume us and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Go near and listen to all the Lord our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you. We will listen and obey. The Lord heard you when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard what this, is, what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Go tell them to return to their tents, but you stay here with me so that I may give you all the commands, decrees, and laws you are to teach them to follow in the land I am giving them to possess. So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. So I'll stop here before I go on to chapter six. Uh, <clears throat> so this is basically a recollection of the events occurring in Exodus. So Moses is reminding the Israelites here, this is what happened. You know, these are the commandments. This is what went down. Um, and you see the Israelites' faith shift here. Um, it's very clear in, in the scripture and the wording um, that is used here. But they understand that, you know, we previously thought when God spoke and you heard it, you died. But here we are, we've survived. You know, they're actually realizing maybe how chosen they are, how important it is God's power and his grace and his majesty. Um, in chapter er, verse 24, it said, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty. And we have heard his voice from the fire. So there's this moment of, oh my gosh, like this is, <clears throat> this is for real, right? This is something that we can't ignore and don't want to, right? Out of, out of fear, out of respect, reverent fear for the Lord. <clears throat> So I like um, verses 32 uh, through the end of chapter five. So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. So he's saying, I've laid out a path for you. I've laid out these laws in order for you to live long and prosper, right? Star Trek fans out there. I've laid down this path so that you could have the best life possible. And I think that's really important to point out because these commandments, it goes even more than, you know, further than these nowadays. But God has laid the path, the groundwork for us to have a prosperous life, for us to have a peaceful life. And we, we achieve that out of obedience and out of faith in God. Uh, verse 33, walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you. So do all these things I'm asking you to do, right? There's only 10, um, at least not only 10, there are more, but uh, focus on these 10. If you can do these, 
then so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. So you're saying, I'm giving you land. You're my chosen people. If you do these things, you're going to be prosperous. You're going to live long in the days of the land I am giving you, okay? Prolong your days. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 6. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, the God of our ancestors, promised you. So at this point, you know, for the Israelites to be wandering this long, obviously they irritated. Like I said, they were complaining, they were sinning, but they're finally about to the point of getting to the land that God promised them, that, law, that God set aside for them. So I don't think it's any coincidence that these laws came into effect right before that, right? Right before they were to inhabit that land so they could take care of it, so they could prosper. And so they may enjoy long life. And I like it, it says in verse three, hear Israel, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you. And you're going to increase, right? Increase in the land of flowing with milk and honey, right? Basic staples, that's an example, a metaphor there. Just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised you. Verse four, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Point is, don't forget these. <laughs> When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery." Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of other people or peoples around you. For the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Thrusting out all your enemies before you as the Lord said. Verse 20. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to, his, to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. So there's a lot of good stuff. I wanted to read in Deuteronomy because it goes even further than explaining, you know, Ten Commandments, how those came about, but it goes further to explain this is what it means, right? This is what I'm leaving you. This is what I want you to teach your children. This is why. This is why I set rules. This is why I lay groundwork. This is why I care enough to do that, right? He's teaching them in this moment through Moses. This is how you prosper. This is how you live long. 
out of faith and obedience and fear of me and not like put the fear of God in me. And he did. Don't worry. And that's probably where that phrase comes from. But it's a reverent fear. It's a respect for his power and for his might. And at, towards the end of these chapters, the Israelites have that and they understand that a little bit more than they did before the Ten Commandments. So I wanted just to kind of give you some background there um, on the commandments themselves. Some, as I read through, can be kind of confusing. So I did go back through and write these down. And I want to go through each one to kind of finish up this teaching here, just so we all understand what it is we're talking about as far as traditional moral values. But one thing I want you to understand before I do that is in Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, these laws, um, and any other laws that were put into place after this time, the point of them was to keep sin at bay, right? There was no other way for people to access God. There was no relationship with God back then. Um, you had to cleanse yourself. You had to, you know, go through rituals. You had to sacrifice animals. But the purpose of law was to keep that sin from reoccurring, to keep it at bay so that these people chosen people and those not could live a successful life, right? Could live a happy life and not be destroyed. But you have to remember that though these traditional values are core of our foundation of what we believe, but the purpose of Jesus was to remove the burden of sin completely. Okay. So yes, we follow law because it's, it's God's word. It's God's truth. Um, it shows an obedience and faith, our obedience and faith in him. But the purpose of sending Jesus was to remove that burden of sin from our lives. So we are no longer held accountable like the Israelites were, like anybody before the new covenant was, which I'm so thankful for, because <laughs> I think a lot of us would be doomed if that was the case. Uh, we'd have to go to a lot of effort to sacrifice animals every time we did something uh, wrong or said something out of context. So always remembering the purpose of Jesus, that you're, there is a reality of sin, but he will free you from that, right? You're forgiven from that if you choose to believe that, if you choose to let go of those things, which we talked about um, more last week. So the Ten Commandments, I'll go through and break them down here. So the first one, you shall have no other gods before me. So... This obviously can get into other religions. Um, if you think of Muslim culture, there are several gods, right? God of rain, God of money, God of sun. Um, the point is there is one God and it is the God, big G, <laughs> not little G. Um, so he's asking you, do not have any gods before me, right? It is me. It's me. I am the almighty one. I created the earth, recognizing who God is and giving him the glory for what he's done and what he's created. So the second, you shall not make idols. So along the same lines, um, idols are things that you worship along with gods, but that could be yourself. It could be media. It could be entertainment. Maybe you worship certain stars, certain actors. Um, maybe it's food. Maybe it's uh, things you don't necessarily think about, you know, when you get into sinful, more sinful things like porn addiction, or maybe it's um, uh, sex, whatever it may be. So when you make idols, when you idolize something, you're putting it before God. You're putting the weight of its importance before God. Okay. That's what exactly what I'm saying here. And it can be anything. Um, a lot of stuff we don't even think about half the time that we're idolizing. It could be your family, your children. Um, maybe it's your husband. Just making sure to always evaluate yourself in that situation and always putting God first is really the goal here, what he's wanting you to do. Commandment three, do not take the Lord's name in vain. So this one, most of us heard as children. Um, I do not use this language at one time in my life, did I? Yes. Um, but you hear, you know, people using God as part of um, cursing. Um, and that is something that he specifically asks you not to do. So is that is that something that's part of your everyday language? Maybe it is. 
maybe you don't feel any conviction about that, um, which is normal. If you don't have a relationship with God, that conviction from Holy Spirit is not going to be there. But once you start to understand who God is and his, his wonder and his glory, and the blessings he gives you, those things kind of fall off. Um, I've told this before on teachings, but I didn't curse all the way up probably through senior year of high school. As soon as I got to college, I got around certain people that use that language pretty commonly. So I picked it up quickly. Um, and I would have the F word flying out of my mouth every other sentence. Uh, for those of you who know me, I hope that comes as a shock. But now those things, there's such conviction around them. I can't even bring myself to mouth the words that I literally, God just pruned that right out of my life. It's not necessary to me anymore. It doesn't advance me or get me anywhere or help me express myself any even more. So um, just being careful not to take God's name in vain. Uh, commandment four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So most of us know Sabbath day as Sunday. That is church day. Churches can also be Monday, Wednesday, any other day. Most of them have several services. Um, but God created the world in six days. And on the seventh, he rested, right? That's that day to hold, be holy. It's the day to remember, even though there should be, you know, reflecting on God every day. That day is just as important to rest in God's peace, to be in prayer, to, to uh, seek him in that time. And so our, the question I wrote down is, are we forsaking the assembly? Church is a very important part of your walk with God. You can have relationship with God. You can have understanding. But if you don't surround yourself with godly people or others, that can encourage and love you in your walk it's going to be hard the enemy is going to corner you it's it's going to be very easy for him to convince you otherwise right to lie to you or convince you to frankly just lie to yourself or for those around you so do not forsake the assembly do not forsake the church it is an important part do churches hurt people yes and i'm sorry if you are one of those people but we are not all like that. They are not all like that. You have to fit where you have to find where you're called, and which is why it's important to be in, in prayer with God and in your words. So you can you can be obedient in those times and hear hear what it is, hear where it is God wants you to be. <clears throat> so remembering Sundays, keeping them holy, not forsaking the church, but pressing into the kingdom family that He's surrounding you with. I know I wouldn't be here in this moment right now without those people that God surrounded in my life. So commandment five, honor your father and mother. So what is our relationship like with our family? Are there grudges? Is there unforgiveness? Do we fight at every holiday? Um, do we throw food at the dinner table? Like, what is it? Um, there's not a lot of honoring fathers and mothers anymore. A lot of families are broken, um, you know, with divorce and, and other things that happen so that that lack of respect is is gone in a lot of instances. You don't see a lot of that anymore. Close families, families that love and encourage each other. So what is your relationship like with your family? Are you harboring unforgiveness or grudges against your mother and father? Are you respecting them and honoring them for who they are, forgetting what they've done to you? Um, definitely an important one. We should honor and respect most people, but he's specifically saying mother and father here. Commandment six, you shall not murder. So this one's pretty clear. I think all of us know that murder equals bad. Murder equals prison time. Um, there are laws outside of religious laws in this country that lock you up if you murder people. So we definitely have that understanding as a nation, but murder goes even further. Um, given the current circumstances of Roe versus Wade, do we consider abortion murder? Do you consider death penalty murder? These are some really hot topics that people have brought up and, and it's really difficult to address sometimes because there's so many opinions on either side. But at the end of the day, I would consider both. Um, 
as being murder for different reasons. Yes, we, we make choices to carry out either or, but at the end of the day, you are kill, taking a life, right? You're taking the life of someone and, and God forgives everybody. So understanding that hard line of, you know, how, how can you forgive a sin that bad? That's why I want to talk about sin last week, because all sin is the same. Though culturally, we believe that rape, that murder is worse than pride and arrogance, right? That's how we perceive things. We let those things go, but the other things we can't let go. So just considering, you know, are we thinking about not committing murder in other ways, right? Are we thinking about these hot button issues that we've heard that people have a lot of a say over? Um, and what other choices can we make before arriving to that point, right? Life comes down to choices. Sin comes down to a choice. Um, why do we have to get to the point of choosing death, right? <clears throat> um, and I think that's the most important takeaway here is just remembering that, you know, that commandment, though very simple, can be very complex in a lot of different ways. Commandment seven, you shall not commit adultery. So obviously that is, um, adultery is, is cheating, right? Cheating on a spouse, cheating on a significant other. Um, you're having sexual emotional relations with other people other than who you've committed to. Um, I wrote too many times marriages aren't taken seriously or seen as a lifelong commitment. So sometimes adultery happens. A lot of times it happens because of that. Um, <clears throat> there's no emotional there's no emotional emphasis on keeping a relationship as long as you can. Those traditional values have really gone out the door, right? Divorce is easy to do. Maybe it takes a little bit longer, but it's our states or our nation makes it pretty easy, right? You fill the paperwork out, you, you move your stuff out and you're done. But understanding that marriage is a lifelong commitment. Marriage is something seen as holy, that God talks about scripturally, it's important. And so understanding that we need to take that seriously, right? That it's, we can't be so nonchalant about adultery, about divorce, about those things, because it's not what God intended for our lives. Commandment eight, you shall not steal. So thinking of the commandments as a child, there was one moment when I, as a child, I stole a piece of gum from a convenience store, but I never forgot that moment because we knew growing up, you do not steal. You do not steal physical things, right? That's what we all think when we hear this. But do you consider getting ahead in life as taking from others, right? You can steal in other ways, maybe through your job. Um, maybe it's a scam through, you know, through the government, through a loophole you found? Are you taking from others? Are you trying to get ahead in other ways? A lot of times we don't consider those as stealing, but are you taking something that is not honestly yours, right? That's what it means uh, when he says you shall not steal. So commandment nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Otherwise, do not lie, right? Do not lie about people. Do not lie to people. Do not lie to God. You can't because he knows the truth all the time. Um, it's a simple question. Are you always honest? Are you honest with yourself? Are you honest with your spouse? Are you honest with your family? Are you honest with your friends, uh, your boss, whatever it may be? Are we living an honest life that whatever words come out of our mouth, are positive and encouraging and not degrading, right? Not bringing others down, not causing havoc or, or gossip or chaos in other people's lives. And the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. So don't be jealous of other people's stuff, right? Um, we live in a society where we're constantly wanting what others have. I want how much money he has. I want a house like she does. I want a body like she does. I would like a wardrobe, a car. I want my children to be well behaved like they are. And on and on and on. This is one I feel like we really lost touch of um, as a nation, as a culture, as a society. 
do not constantly be in the state of wanting someone else's life, someone else's stuff, because yours is never going to be good enough. But with God, it is good enough because he blesses you with the things you have. It may not be luxury. It may not be an airplane. It may not be a 200 square foot closet or whatever it may be. What he will give you is enough. God is enough. You don't need have the need to cover other people's things, to be jealous or to constantly be in desire or need of those things. So that's a breakdown of the 10 commandments, just explaining them a little bit more and kind of comparing where we've gotten off track here. Um, there's a lot of other moral values I've seen come into question specifically, like I said, people my age, um, which I am 30, so it kind of gives you an idea of, of the generation that I am in. But a lot of traditional norms traditional practices are being challenged now, right? Tradition is not cool. Tradition is not fun. It's, it's taking away our rights. It's taking away our pride. There's an anti-tradition movement happening in this world. Um, and I've seen a lot of it lately with my friends, with people on social media. And there, these values, which I, I listed a few here, but hetero marriage, right? Marriage between man and woman. Um, woman and man roles in marriages and jobs. It's biblical that the man is the head of the house. And I know you ladies that are probably listening cringe when I say that, but I'm saying that out of respect for a, my own husband, right? As a woman who is married and has that leadership in her home, right? You, you respect your husband because that is what God intended man woman came from man eve came from adam right that is how things were purposefully made and raising children um i've had more conversations lately about how people are so fearful about bringing children into the world that they don't even want to right there's talk of vasectomies there's talk of you know birth control methods people really get uptight about that as well with roe versus wade that they're going to take away our rights to even do that they're going to force me to raise children whatever it may be there's this stigma of and fear paralyzing people but the thing is if we're not raising children if we're not advancing the kingdom and, and teaching kids up in the traditional moral values of god and, and in relationship with god the future of this country of this world is really going to be at stake um it's going to be difficult it's going there's going to be new issues that come up there's going to be new movements there's going to be new challenges of the laws that we've had for hundreds of years which all can be good things don't get me wrong um but when you're outright against the word of god that is where we crumble as a nation right we stand firm and we are recreated on god's principles on these understanding understandings these basic theories um, not theories, but basic laws, right? Basic understanding and moral principles. And that's totally out of the picture. What is left for this country? And I, I know a lot of us probably fear that. And I'm not trying to instill fear in you. It's just important to know that prayer, that's where that comes into handy, right? We don't have the control over those things, but God does. He has the plan. He has the control. So leave it in his hands. If it's something you're worried about or concerned about, or if it consumes your thoughts at night, leave it in his hands and he will take care of it. It will come to fruition. The plan he has for this country, this nation, this world. Uh, I'll leave it on that note um, before I get into any further deep conversations here. But as always, if you have questions, comments, um, please respectfully reach out to me in messages or however you want to do that. Um, most of you probably know me. So definitely approach me if you have a question. Otherwise, I appreciate you listening um, every week. And again, this week, I'm going to teach on woke but not awake probably one more week. Um, and then I will take a little break while I have a baby here in the next month or so, which is exciting. So thank you for holding on, for sticking with me. 
for just listening. Um, it's, it's unusual for someone of my age to be talking about this, but I think it's important that we do because uh, not a lot of others are. So here I am putting it out there. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen and I hope you have a good rest of the week. Bye.